Someone said body control is not the main thing. Body control is everything. If we really hope to achieve higher levels of horsemanship, if we envision more performance, more refinement, more athleticism from our horse, then we've got to have body control. So this is a series of exercises that I do, and you don't have to go home and do it like me, but you've got to do something because everybody that's getting something done has some way to control these body parts. And what I'm talking about are four different parts, our horse's head and neck, their shoulders, their rib cage, and their hind end. I call it four-part harmony. It's like having a singing group that goes in and sings a song. It doesn't sound quite right. They sing it again and again and again. It never sounds right. What they desperately need is a director to step in and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You three guys, you go take a break. You, sir, you stay with me. You don't know your part. He identifies where the problem is because the other three guys can be perfect. But if the one singer doesn't know his part, it's not going to be four-part harmony. That's what we need to do with our horse. Analyze why didn't he pick up his left lead? Was the problem in the shoulders? Was the problem in the rib cage? So here are the exercises that I do to get control over those body parts. And for me, it starts in part number one, my horse's head and neck. I've got to get my horse soft and supple, what you might call collection, what you might call a horse carrying a soft feel, or an English rider might say on the bit, or you might say driving a horse up into the bridle. When I pick up on those bridle reins, I need my horse to come in and say, yes, sir, what can I do for you? Rather than uh, 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 just a busy signal. I need that horse to get soft in my hands. And I don't try to get control over their head and neck just using my hands. You will see me use my hands and my legs in harmony with each other, where I'll hold with my hands and drive with my legs. Now it starts for me right when I ask my horse to begin to back up. I not only want him to move his feet backwards, but I'm looking for him to give his face at the same time. Once I have a little bit of that going at the backup, then we start asking for it walking forward as well. But as in everything else, don't get greedy. People ask for too much too soon with vertical flexion and collection and then our horses get resentful, they get tired, it's mentally fatiguing, it's physically fatiguing for them to continue to hold that frame. And so at first, if I just get a step or two, then that, that's good. I'm gonna release and let my horse walk out of it and we can build up to have them holding it for longer periods of time and at higher rates of speed as time goes on. But we've gotta get them giving their face, vertical flexion, holding with my hands, driving with my legs, and that's what collection is, vertical flexion with impulsion. That's why I keep my legs busy to pick up my horse's back and drive my horse's hindquarters up into that front end. Then my horse is in an athletic frame. So they've just, every time, have got to get soft and give me their face when I pick up on them. And how long will I work on this part number one in vertical flexion? Their entire life. Because there is a tendency in them their entire life to get bracy and get reachy and, and stick their nose out. And so we're constantly reprogramming them, constantly reminding them to come in and get soft, that that's the best answer for them. And what feels pretty good at the walk? When you speed things up and put a little pressure on them, it's liable to fall apart. That's why these things have to be built up little by little. I will do this idea of head and neck control in a train track circle as well. Can I step around in a circle using my inside rein and inside leg, just like a train on a track with his nose being the engine and his tail being the caboose. Can he stay soft in his face? Can he give to that inside rein? Can he arc and bend his body around with his hind feet reaching right up into the tracks of those front feet? Getting that head and neck control. Everything that your horse does, whether he can do flying lead changes or sliding stops or spins, I don't think you're gonna like any of those maneuvers if you don't like the way they felt in their face. They've gotta yield and get soft. When that nose comes up, they hollow out their back. When they hollow out their back, they lose their collection and they lose their athleticism and they can't do anything at a higher level of performance anyway. Now, collection is not just getting their nose down and getting them going slow. I think collection could be at any rate of speed. It could be going very fast and still have collection. Again, it's vertical flexion with impulsion, and that's part number one. As I mentioned, don't try to do it exclusively with your hands. Hold with your hands and drive with your legs. Here's a little trainer's tip. As you're playing with your horse and you feel him kind of bracing your hands, if you will widen out your hands and create more of a V, 
from your hands down to your horse's face, sometimes they'll get off that bridle a little bit better rather than just pulling straight back. But again, it's not much pulling anyway. It's a holding with our hands and a driving with our legs. This takes us to part number two, getting control of the shoulders. And I start this exercise from the train track circle that we've already established. If I'm using my inside rein and inside leg, getting my horse to walk around with an arc and a bend in his body in this circle, I'm going to maintain this circle, but I'm going to put my horse's body configuration in a counter bend. And this is one of the few times that I want to be able to see my horse's outside eye. The vast majority of the time, I want to be able to see the eye in the direction in which I'm going. But now I'm going to ask my horse to counter bend. So I'm going to maintain this circle, maintain forward momentum, but I'm going to lift with my outside rein and draw it towards my inside shoulder. So I'm going to lift with that rein right up along his neck. I'm going to use my outside leg and foot way up by the cinch in the forward front position and walk those shoulders around. I'm looking for this outside leg to cross over this inside leg as he steps, 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 steps around this circle. Now, I don't want it to turn into a funky spin or a funky side pass where I learn, lose my forward momentum. I want to keep him walking forward, but walk those shoulders over in a counter bend so I can see the corner of his outside eye. Now, if you walk out tomorrow morning and you see your horse walking around like this, you better call the vet. Something terrible happened during the night. They don't walk around like that naturally. But this is a, an exercise, a suppling exercise, a shoulder control exercise to gain control over those body parts. Get some steps you like. Don't get greedy right at first and then walk them right back in a train track circle. Establish your circle again and then you can pick up on them again and try it both ways. What are they learning here? They're learning a cadence. You see my horse's feet stepping over the outside leg, stepping over the inside leg with forward momentum. Having this kind of shoulder control is going to make a huge difference when I try to lope circles. You ever heard your trainer say, he's dropping his shoulder, you got to get his shoulder picked up. How do we do that? What in the world does that mean? Pick up their shoulder. If I can pick up then what will be my inside rein and inside leg if I'm loping to the left, and lift that up because he understands what shoulder control is about, I can pick that shoulder up and get it straight. So it has a practical application. So much of the difficulty we have with performance horses is what happens in their shoulders. And so whether you do it just like this or you do it a little different, we've got to do something to have control over part number two, which is our horse's shoulders. Part number three in my four part harmony series is rib cage control. Being able to control that rib cage left and right. And in essence, what I'm talking about is a side pass. And I'm going to contrast today what I call a side pass from a leg yield. And if these terms don't quite jive with your background and your training, that's all right. You can call it whatever you want, but I think we can agree that the body movements are different. Back in kindergarten, our horses learned how to leg yield. When we pushed them over to the left, they moved over to the left, but they were bent to the right. We could see their right eye in that counter bend. Now we're going to ask for our horses to step over with straightness, where we cannot see that outside eye. And this is 10 times harder. I used to think I was side passing. That's what I called it, but really I was just leg yielding. But now that I understand what this straightness is all about, this is what I term a true side pass. Don't be afraid of a little forward momentum in this side pass, because what you don't want is that horse rocking back. If he's rocked back, he's going to hit like this. His, his feet are, are not going to pass over smoothly. And so I will walk forward and then if I'm going to step over to the left, I'll lift with that leading rein right up along his neck, my left rein, and use my right leg in right in the middle of his belly, position number two, to push my horse over in that direction. I want to be able to see the corner of my horse's leading eye now. So I'm holding up with that rein, probably counterbalancing with my outside rein just a little bit to help keep him straight and see if my horse can step over. And if I could just see the corner of that inside eye, that would be really cool. Or if he's perfectly straight and I can't see either eye, that's acceptable. But again, we're thinking about straightness, not leading with his shoulder, not counter bent. But all these exercises are interconnected. The better one is, the better the next one will be. The better your shoulder control exercise is, the more meaning this will have. Because if we lift with that inside rein right up along our horse's neck, that will feel like shoulder control where he was to respect that rein and keep his shoulders picked up. Now we push that rib cage over. Get some steps we like and then let him walk forward and out of that. Then you can ask again, ask to the left and to the right. Now we're contrasting leg yielding and side passing. But 
I don't work on leg yielding for six months and then on the first day of the seventh month say, okay, now I'm going to start side passing with straightness. But I'm always in my mind heading that way. I'm heading towards more straightness all the time. At first, oh, my horse is going to be real counterbent and, and crooked and it's going to be awkward and then the leg yield is going to get a little better. But I'm always trying to get them shaped up a little bit straighter, a little bit straighter until I'm using more leading rein and got my horse's head, neck, and shoulders really straight. Now I can see his inside eye and have that horse step over with straightness. Now again, nobody's going to give you a blue ribbon for doing any one of these parts, but these parts are our means to an end. I want to do the big spins and the flying lead changes and the sliding stops and the canter departures, but if I can't do these exercises, I don't have the foundation to build this house that I want to live in. I'm just dreaming. You know, you can, you can say you want cake all day long, but if you don't have the ingredients to make cake, you're, you're not going to have cake. And so this is what four-part harmony does for me. Say I'm asking a horse to spin around in circles. But rather than spinning on his hindquarters, he's kind of coke bottling around. What I might do at that moment is I might turn him one, two, three times around. I'm not happy with it. I might pick up that inside rein and march him over sideways in that part number three side pass. Remind him that he needs to move off that outside leg, that he needs to get his shoulders straight and he can't swing his rib cage and his hind end into my leg in a coke bottling turn. But if he doesn't know how to do part number three, I have no frame of reference to refer back to. So that's why we do this side passing exercise. Part number four, hindquarter control. Being able to control our horse's hindquarters independent of the rest of their body. Now, way back in kindergarten when this horse was just young, we talked about hindquarter control then. Sliding our hand down that rein, drawing it up towards our body, using our inside leg and disengaging their hindquarters. And that was important for that time. But now we're at a higher level. Now I'm going to ask for hindquarter control with straightness, without bending my horse, without tipping my horse's nose. Anybody can move the hindquarters out of the way if I'll let them tip their nose. But I want you to sit on your horse nice and straight, get their head, neck, and shoulders really straight in your hands, and envision what it would be like if your horse had hobbles on his front feet, or if his front feet were standing on a little pedestal. How still would he have to be? Now I use my outside leg back and in, position number three, back towards the back cinch, and ask those hindquarters to walk around, pivoting around the front end, a turn on the forehand, as it were. And again, you don't have to get all the way around at first, just get a step or two. But we've got to have control of these hindquarters if we hope to canter off on the correct lead on a straight line, or if we hope to do a flying lead change. Dressage riders will do a variation of this exercise. They'll call it haunches in. Perhaps they'll walk down the rail and keep their shoulders really straight, horse's shoulders really straight, and ask the hip to tip to the inside. We need that hip to work and hinge independent of the rest of their body. For me, this is part number four, hindquarter control. When these parts are really working well for me, and I think that, yeah, he passes each test pretty well, I'm going to put them together to see if I really have any harmony. And I put them together in a backwards circle. This backward circle, I'm going to have my horse bent in the direction or arced in the direction in which he is going. And it shows me or reveals to me just how broke my horse is through his body. And are there sticky spots? Are there bracy spots in his head and neck or his shoulders or rib cage or hind end? So I might start this exercise from part number four. I'm standing perfectly still. I move the hindquarters over, get two or three steps that I like. Then I shift my weight pick up my inside rein, use predominantly my outside leg, and walk that hind end around, having this horse go in a backward circle. If you were to videotape me walking around in a train track circle, and then you just push the rewind button, and you watched me in reverse in that circle, the arc wouldn't change, wouldn't it? My horse's body configuration would be the same, just going backwards. That's, in essence, what I'm talking about in this backward circle. Asking my horse to stay soft in his face and back around and back around that circle. Work it one way, work it the other way. It really reveals to me, do I have a sticky spot? Do I have a spot that's not quite right? Are those four parts that I worked on, is it just a trick or does it really have a practical application? So backing in that circle really melds all the pieces together. And as my daughter Sarah likes to say, dad really gets them broke through their body.